Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the Vantage Seminar. And we're continuing our series of talks this week on uh, curves and abelian varieties over finite fields. And today we're very happy to have Christelle Vincent talking about exploring angle rank using the LMFDB. And Christelle, is it all right for me to video this talk? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Well, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Well, first, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, you know, I've loosely followed Vantage since it was created in 2020, and it's an incredible honor to be invited to speak. Um, also, before I get started, I just want to put it out there that what's about to happen to some extent is all fake. Like once I start the record, the you know the the actual slides, like I'll seem like. I'm really excited about math and I know all this math and, um, you know, things are going well, <laughs> but I want to acknowledge that we're in the middle of a global pandemic. Things are really tough for a lot of people. Some people are doing great and I'm happy for them. Um, I'm one of the people for which this is really difficult. Um, I've had like mental health issues related to this, the stress, the anxiety having to do with it. So I just want to say that if you're struggling, you're not the only one. And, um, you know, I'm thinking about you and I hope you can also accomplish some things. What small things you can accomplish now are great. Um, I'm also going to start by acknowledging the generous support of various organizations that have supported this work. Um, so first, my research is supported by the NSF. Uh, we started working on the database that I'm going to present um, at a week-long workshop at AIM, uh, so that was great. ICERM hosted uh, the LMFDB gang for one semester, and I went to that, and that was certainly part of, you know, my, my training to be ready to actually develop my own database. And finally, um, the Simons Foundation is supporting the LMFDB pretty significantly um, right now, so um, thank you. So all of them for making this possible. So I have um, two goals and um, sorry, I just realized that I don't have the chat open and I'm not sure how to see it. So you can type in the chat and hopefully someone will let me know and read it to me. Sorry. <laughs> okay. okay, so my we'll first goal is, sorry? We'll take care of that. Okay, no, thank you so much. We use, we're a Teams campus at UVM, so this whole Zoom thing is still bewildering to me, um, two years in the pandemic. So I want to start by giving an introduction to the LMFDB, like just like, I mean, to our database in the LMFDB, the database of isogeny classes of abelian varieties over finite fields. And then um, after that, I want to talk about some angle rank results, um, some of which I got um, Oh, sorry, now I'm in the wrong, <laughs> I'm in the wrong program. Okay, some of which um, we got as part of our work um, with, you know, Taylor Dupuy, Karen Kidlaya, and uh, David Rowe, but also um, some result of Taylor Dupuy's, Karen Kidlaya's, and Zurich Brown angle ranks. They just uh, put out a paper on angle ranks of abelian varieties, and it's such a beautiful construction uh, that I feel like I want the whole world to know about it. So those are the two goals to um, just talk about the LMFDB and then some angle rank results. Okay, I keep clicking elsewhere. So I'm gonna do like quick, quick, quick background. I know it's part of a whole series on abelian varieties. So, you know, I'm expecting that you kind of know what that is, um, but I, I did invite, you know, some of my friends to come. So. I told them I would tell them what this was about. So an abelian variety is a variety that's also a group, right? So, and, and as it turns out, when you're a variety and a group, you have to be an abelian group. So that's why we don't call it like a group variety, but an abelian variety. So the variety part is like, oh, everything's given by like polynomials, rational functions, right? And then the group part is like, oh, the solutions of these polynomials can be like added together and have a group structure. And then we'll be talking about isogeny classes. So an isogeny is in a sense, like the right kind of math between abelian varieties, right? If you're, you know, I mean, you could read this whole thing, but either you already know what it means or 
you might not be able to make sense of this, right? But but just think like like you know when you study rings, you want to study ring morphisms, and when you study you know modules, you want to study maps of modules, right? When you study abelian varieties, you want to study isogenies. They're a right kind of map. And as it turns out, um, when you have an isogeny from A1 to A2, then you always have an isogeny back from A2 to A1. So actually the relation of having an isogeny between two uh, abelian varieties is an equivalence relation. So you can study an isogeny class of abelian varieties, which is what we'll do. Now, um, we'll specifically be talking about isogeny classes of abelian varieties over finite fields, um, because partly because it's the uh, topic of this series of talks. Um, so in that case, we can associate to the isogeny class something called the Weil polynomial. And like once again, right, um, there is the definition, which I mean, if you know what the Frobenius is and the cohomology group is, you probably already know what a veil polynomial is. Um, so if not, just think, you know, every isogeny class has a polynomial. And um, there's, I'm, I'm about to articulate um, a kind of one-to-one -one correspondence between the polynomials and the, abelian, the isogeny classes of abelian varieties, which is what we'll use to make the database. So throughout the talk, um, G is always going to be the dimension of the isogeny class. If you remember, from the definition of isogeny, which I didn't read, so maybe you don't, right? An isogeny has to be between two abelian varieties of the same dimension. Therefore, every abelian variety in the isogeny class has the same dimension. So I'll just call it the dimension of the isogeny class. But it doesn't mean that the isogeny class itself is like some kind of vector space, right? I just mean that the, the um, dimension of the stuff in the class. And I'll also uh, pretty consistent, no, not just pretty consistent, always use Q for the cardinality of the base field. And Q is a power of P. When P shows up, um, that's the characteristic of the field. And then um, it is a fact, right, that every isogeny class has a V polynomial. And it's not just like any polynomial, right? It's like a very specific kind of polynomial. So, so the P is the V polynomial, but it can be obtained from another polynomial that has integer coefficients of degree G and that has all real roots um, between minus two Q root two, uh, minus two root two, you root Q and two root Q. And so it might not seem like much, but actually um, these conditions are enough to go through and generate all the polynomial cues like this. Like it's, 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 it's a smaller set than just, you know, all polynomials of degree G. Um, and, and it's something that you're able to, to program, like put it in. Um, I mean, you know, not like tell the computer, like check that all the real roots are there, but like you use like the rule of signs and rule, rules theorem and, and things like that. Um, oops. And what's good is that basically every polynomial of that kind is of a polynomial that we're looking for. So what do I mean by basically? So if the isogeny class is simple, so what does it mean to be simple? It means I look at all the abelian varieties in my isogeny class and in it, there's no abelian variety that's a product of two lower dimensional abelian varieties, right? So if that doesn't happen, right? Like every abelian variety in the isogeny class is like legit, dimension G, like not a product of two lower dimension things, then we say the whole class is simple. And in that case, the V polynomial of the class is some irreducible polynomial to a power. And what's more is that power is given by H. So it's not like two different things, like a polynomial and a power, but it's like H tells you the power that it needs to be the V polynomial of a simple isogeny class. And then, right, the kind the correspondence is that if you're doing the thing to look for V polynomials, right, you're like enumerating all special polynomials of this kind, then whenever a polynomial like this that you get is irreducible, it's gonna be the H of some isogeny class. So, you know, the upshot is that. Abelian varieties, you know, are complicated things, whole series, you know. 
whole vantage series about them. But when you focus on isogeny classes, instead of working with like a kind of difficult set of things, you can just work with one polynomial. And like, who doesn't love polynomials? Polynomials are simple, polynomials are happy. And not only, you know, do the isogeny classes have polynomials that are like so special that we can list them all efficiently, but also like every polynomial that we list is an isogeny class, like gives us an isogeny class, right? So, so we don't have to like list all the pol polynomials and then like hope they're isogeny classes, okay? And so this is, you know, the, the basis of the data, the basis of any kind of database is that you have to be able to list the stuff that's in that's going to be in the database. You have to have some way to generate the things that are in there and you have to have some way to have a handle on them. And so these vape polynomials are how we, um, you know, get our hands on enumerating isogeny classes. So in 2016, we went ahead and did that. Um, Taylor Dupuy, one of the authors, a few years earlier was talking to um, a friend of ours, Alex Miller, who was a PhD student at the University of Michigan back then. And he was doing his PhD thesis on um, the piatic valuation of point counts on varieties. And, and during his, his work, like this idea um, of angle rank, which I will um, be talking about for the rest of the talk, kind of came up and um, we, we, we wanted to study it. Actually, yeah, no, sorry. So that's something I'm supposed to say later. I kind of got ahead of myself, but whatever, it's not false. It's still true, okay? But anyway, um, in, in 2016, we had this workshop at AIM, and so we had time to work on it. We started um, listing all of them. And then, of course, right, not just like a list of isogeny classes, like what would that even give us, right? But like to put them online in a like really nice way. So what does the database look like? I'm supposed to introduce you to it. So first, LMFDB, okay, it's a bunch of letters. They get better and better as you practice. But the L is for L functions and MF is for modular form and DB is for database. And um, here is the kind of core of the database of isogeny classes of abelian varieties over finite fields. The main kind of thing in the database or like the main way you can interact with it is that each isogeny class has a page that contains all of the information about it. And you should be thinking maybe of, you know, someone's page on Wikipedia, right? The, the page on, I'm gonna mention Ken Ono, my PG advisor, because he was recently in a beer commercial. So he's in the news, right? He has his page and like maybe a photo of him and some like statistics about him and then like a story about his life, right? So this is that, but for a nice agony class of abelian varieties. So up here we have which one it is. Um, and then, you know, some basic invariants, so the base field, right? So um, when I'm talking about an abelian variety, it's defined over some field. Um, what, I, what I didn't stress when I was talking about isogenies is that you can talk about isogenies defined over a field, right? So here, when I'm talking about this base field F2, is that all the abelian varieties in the isogeny class are defined over F2, and the isogenies between them are also defined over F2. Then the dimension, right? We talked about how all the abelian varieties in the isogeny class have the same dimension. So this one is three. And so in the name of the isogeny class, you can see three for the dimension and two for the um, cardinality of the field. And then there's this thing here um, called the L polynomial. Now the L polynomial is not the V polynomial, but it's almost the V polynomial, right? The V polynomial would be the reverse of the L polynomial. So the here, the V polynomial would be x to the 6 minus 4 x to the 5 plus 9 x to the 4 minus 15 x cubed plus 18 x squared minus 16 x plus 8, right? Just like switch um, the, the powers of x, like the order, you know, from, from there to there. So, I mean, this is basically the V polynomial. Um, the Frubini's angle, angle rings I'll talk about, the number field I'll talk about, the Galois group I'll talk about. So these are just like more invariants of the isogeny class. Um, and then finally, like I just want to um, mention, right? So um, 
what is Jacobians, right? Well, when you have an isogenin class of abelian varieties, it is not true that they'll all be Jacobians or not be Jacobians, but you can wonder, right, of all these abelian varieties, like how many are Jacobians do we even know? And so in this case, uh, we know that there's no Jacobians in that isogenin class. Sometimes there will be one, you know, um, but in this case, there isn't one. And then it, it continues, right? So, um, you know, I wanted to take an image that was a good size, um, but there's more stuff. There's the endomorphism ring. There's, you know, so so all of the information um, that the database has on this particular isogeny class is on the page of the isogeny class. Oh, and the rest of the name, right? So, so this is the name or the label, right, of this isogeny class. And I just want to tell you, because you're like, three, two, okay, okay, but then like A, E, J, A, P, what, right? Um, the the A, E, J, A, P um, are these three coefficients. So the A in front is to say that this is negative, and then E is for four because B is one, C is two, D is three, and E is four, right? Then the J is nine with no A in front because it's positive. And then uh, AP, right? The A is a negative. And then I can only assume that P is the 16th letter in the alphabet, right? So um, the the label is is just like a machine readable way to encode um, the information of the V polynomial or the L polynomial. Now, how do you like access them? I mean, you can always like if you have an abelian variety in mind, you know it's a vape polynomial, you can just like directly go to it. But like in real life, right, this database was put together for research. So you might want to browse to see what's possible. So you can browse by dimension, right? Like you want to know all the isogeny classes of dimension five that are in the database or um, by the cardinality of the base field. Um, we've even pulled out some interesting ones that have some properties. So the one that I had um, on the previous page, I, I got from this interesting list, but honestly, I don't remember. <laughs> why it was interesting. Um, so that's like, if you're just kind of looking, you know, I mean, if you're browsing, um, and then there's a kind of more powerful um, search option, right? So say, you know, you're like really specifically looking at, you know, only simple abelian varieties um, that have no Jacobian in the isogeny class and um, in characteristic three for whatever reason, right? Then you can pull up like all of the ones that are in the database um, that have these properties. So when you go, right, lmfdb.org, that's where all of the LMFDB is, and then variety, abelian FQ. So that's um, the kind of like landing page of our specific database. You're hit, um, you know, with, with the search page. And then like, as you start searching, you'll, you'll reach the page of individual isogeny classes and um, you'll be able to find stuff out, right? Like if you're wondering, can you have um, P rank two and um, dimension one, right? You could put those things in and, and see, you can't. All right, so now the reason, right? So, I mean, one of the reasons to build a database is like, you know, it, it's a service to the community and it's super cool and everybody loves abelian varieties. But um, one of the ulterior motives was to study angle ranks of abelian varieties. So that's the story I started telling too early, right? So Alex Miller was um, studying them, not under this name in his PhD thesis and um, Taylor was talking to him about it. And it was really hard to find out much about angle ranks. Um, I will define it in a second, right? So now, right now it's just like color commentary. Um, it, it was really hard to pin down like what's possible, what are even conjectures that we can make um, about angle rank. And so a, a kind of good idea was like, let's just generate data, right? And let's just generate like the maximum amount of data and put it on the internet and make a database of it angle rings. Well, before I can tell you about angle rings, I have to tell you about angles. 
So if you remember, right, the Vey polynomial is some characteristic polynomial of some Frobenius, okay? And that means that the absolute value of each of the roots of this polynomial is the square root of Q, where Q, remember, is the size of the base field. So that means that the information of the roots is only the angle that it makes, right? Or the argument, as we would call it fancily in complex analysis, because we know that all of the roots lay on a circle of radius root Q. And so you can see, well, okay. So technically this is a circle showing the roots of the L polynomial, um, but the L of the, the roots of the L polynomial and the V polynomial are just like one over them. So um, the, the roots of the L polynomial are on a circle of radius one over root Q and the roots of the Vey polynomial are on a, cir a circle of size root Q, but they have the same positions, right? So we see um, that, that for this particular isogeny class, right? One of the roots has argument like very small 0.04, right? Very near the x-axis. That's a polynomial with real coefficients. So if, if there's a root, the complex conjugate will also be a root. So we see some symmetry. And then there's another root here um, that has angle like a, about pi over three, right? So, so, so these are um, like, that's not the angle in radians. So this is like this times pi is the angle in radian, right? So you see like about um, a third of the way up there. And then we see like uh, 0.52, right? So it's like just past the halfway mark. And so with just the information of the angles, you can recreate the roots because you know their absolute value. So those are the Frobenius angles. They're just, I mean, they're basically the roots of the characteristic polynomial, but it's just keeping track of their angles because we know their absolute value or their argument because we know their modulus. Okay, so it's the angle rank. Well, you got some angles. The rank is how big, right? Like how big a space they generate. So it's basically the dimension of the Q vector space that's spanned by these angles. It's not quite, okay? So if I have, um, the Vey polynomial and um, alpha i are the roots, then the angle rank is, is defined like this, right? So, so let's like work inside out. We have these angles that I was talking about, right? We can take the principal branch of the um, argument function and then divide it by pi, right? Because we saw like it was like a third, a half, you know? Um, so, so these are the, the, the Frobenius angles as listed um, on the LMFDB. You, you list them all and then you also throw in the number one. Okay, and then you take the Q span of this set, whatever it is, right? Like these are a bunch of numbers. You 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 take their um their Q span, and then you take the dimension of that and you subtract one from the dimension. So that's weird, right? Like why are you throwing in some extra number? Which like if one is not in this span, right? Then you've added a dimension to your vector space and then you immediately take it away. So you're like, well, why, why did you do that? Like take it, give it and then take it away, right? And if one is in the span of the angles, then, um, you know, the union one doesn't do anything. And then you're subtracting one from the rank. And, and that's weird. Well, the reason is that if you're working with um, a simple um, isogeny class, then one will be in the span of the angles only if your uh, class is super singular. And then um, the, the, this whole span will, will just have dimension one and then the angle rank will be zero. Okay, so that's just the, the same expression again that I've like moved up so you can still see it, right? Because it is complicated and it takes a while to wrap your mind around. Um, the angle rank is between zero and G inclusively, right? Because like I said, um, this whole thing in there could have dimension one and then you could take it away. So that could be zero overall, right? And then the worst or the best, I don't know, it depends what you like, right? But the most that could happen is that I have two G roots, but I know that I always have a root in its complex conjugate. So I'm most like this part has rank G. 
maybe I add one, so that gives me a vector space of dimension G plus one, and then I subtract one. That's the worst or best that can happen. So the angle rank is always between zero and G, where G is the dimension. And angle rank is zero if and only if um, the isogeny class is super singular. So, um, so those are just facts. Like if you're wondering, <laughs> you put all this together, what happens? Those are just quick facts. We'll get used to it more. And uh, from now on, for the rest of the talk, um, we'll talk only about geometrically simple isogeny classes. So before I talk about an isogeny class being simple, if there was no product in the isogeny class of lower dimensional abelian varieties. Now, um, as you increase the base field, the isogeny class gets bigger, right? Because you have like more and more coefficients to make isogenies out of. So your abelian varieties are like more and more isogenous to like more things. So geometrically simple means that even if you extend your base field to the algebraic closure, there's still no decomposable abelian variety. There's no product of abelian varieties in the like big, big, big isogeny class that you get as you pass to the algebraic closure. And in that case, the only way you can be super singular um, and also geometrically sim simple is to be um, a super singular elliptic curve. Um, so dimension one. So basically what I'm saying is that I'm not going to worry too much about angle rank zero here. I'm, I'm not going to think about like what happens if, if all the roots are real, right? Um, because in the geometrically simple case that only happens for super singular elliptic curves and like, I'm just gonna ignore. But like I'm, you know, we're just gonna talk about like we have complex numbers. Some quick angle rank history. Um, the first use of um, the angle rank that I found was um, 1979 by Zarin, and he was studied like some Lie algebra. Like I'm, I'm not even gonna pretend to know <laughs> what Lie algebra he was studying, um, but what was what he was trying to show was that like you got a Lie algebra for every L. So this was a variety over number field, right? So he was saying like the L adic Galois representation attached to an abelian variety over number field is you vary L. And, and there's a conjecture that like a part of it is the same no matter what L is. Okay, so I mean, that should feel familiar, like usually over number fields, if you're doing like l cohomology should not depend on L, that's just the vibe. Um, so what Zarin showed is that for each L, okay, the rank of the part of the Lie algebra that was supposed to be the same was always the maximal angle rank of the reductions of the abelian variety, right? So you have an abelian variety in characteristic zero, you can reduce it mod P or, you know, mod you know, primes, um, all the primes the, of good reduction, each of them has an angle rank, right? It's part of some isogeny class has an angle rank. And like the maximum value that this angle rank takes over all the reductions, the good reductions of the abelian variety is the rank of that part of the Lie algebra. And, and that result was independent of L. And so there, then he could show that the rank was independent of L going through the angle rank. So it was pretty cool. Um, a lot of the more recent work on actually, except for this um, particular thing, most of the work on angle ranks for abelian varieties over finite fields have to do with the Tate conjecture. Now, um, the Tate conjecture is to say that you know, certain cohomology classes are of a certain kind. Like that's also not something that I uh, really want to get into, uh, but it's really important. You know, if you're a number theorist, you know, Tate, he's a big deal. He gave his name to the conjecture. It's obviously something we care about, right? And so um, in 94, Zarin actually showed that if their rank, angle rank is maximal, then all the Tate classes are generated in code dimension one, which, Okay, whatever. But Tate himself proved that um, the Tate conjecture holds in co-dimension one. So one um, 
way to prove that the Tate conjecture is true for an abelian variety over a finite field is to show that it has maximal angle rank. If it has maximal angle rank, you'll get that the Tate classes are generated in code dimension one, which we know means they're of the right kind. And so the Tate conjecture is true. Okay. Conversely, if the angle rank is not maximal, right, is not G, then there are exotic Tate classes, which are not like bad, but they're not generated in code dimension one. And so we don't know if they're algebraic or not, right? And so um, basically the, the, what this is telling you is that if the angle rank is not maximal, there are definitely bad classes that we don't know how to handle. Like you can't hope that somehow it's still all generated in code dimension one and the Tate conjecture is like automatically true. It's not to say that the Tate conjecture is not true, right? It's just saying that there's a class for which the theorem doesn't apply automatically. So that was also in the nineties um, that this was done. And so most of the papers on angle rank for a billion varieties over finite fields are like, taking a certain kind of abelian variety, showing it has maximal angle rank and therefore the Tate conjecture is true. Like, I, I mean, I think literally, except for that 79 paper, um, that's all I've seen about this. So it's a powerful way to show um, the Tate conjecture. So what can you do with data? Well, one thing that you can do is disprove a conjecture, right? So I talked about how um, when we started the database, like not much one was known about angle rank. I mean, we had these results, like if the rank is G, the Tate, right? But like there wasn't so much known of like, well, when is the angle rank G, right? Like, like how, how does this tell us when the Tate conjecture is true? Um, and so to give you like an example of the kind of things you know, that was conjectured due to the lack of data. Um, in 2010, Amadi and Sparlinski conjectured that every ordinary geometrically simple Jacobian over a finite field has angle rank G, the dimension of that Jacobian. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about um, ordinary um, isogeny classes later is just like a certain kind of a billion variety. And in that same paper, um, they showed that this was Tr not only true in dimension two, but actually they didn't even need the ordinary assumption in dimension two. So like in gym, in dimension two, every geometrically simple Jacobian has maximal and angle rank. And that was kind of like, you know, what they, they were just like, let's just conjecture this with, with the ordinary condition. Um, then Zarin, not, you know, not too, um, I mean, five years later showed that the conjecture is true, is true in dimension three with the ordinary condition. So then you do need the ordinary condition, right? But then when we, you know, finished the database, we found examples in dimension four where the conjecture was false. So we can exhibit um, isogeny classes over a field of size three and size five that, um, are you know ordinary geometrically simple and contain a Jacobian and um, doesn't have maximal angle rank. So that I mean, you know, if, if you don't know these mathematicians, I mean, they're big deals. Like th these aren't just like you know some some people like guessing what was happening, but it's just to show like how little we knew, right? That that it was like you know some some conjecture that turns out to be false in, in dimension four, right? We we didn't have a good way to test or like find out what could be true. Yeah, but that's a little destructive. So you can also be constructive. You can make new conjectures and you can prove them if you're lucky. Um, and so one natural line of inquiry, right, like given that you might want to show that the angle rank is maximal, is to like figure out the relationship of angle rank to other isogeny class invariants. So um, I haven't talked about the Newton polygon yet. And so people who know the Newton polygon, maybe you can see how it will fit in or maybe not. It will be clear. Um, but a natural thought is that the angle rank is related to the Newton polygon and the Galois group of the um, isogeny class. And that's not false, but it's also not the whole truth. Once we had the database, we could see that there were isogeny classes that had the same Newton polygon and the same Galois group, but different angle rank. And so we could see that experimentally, 
that couldn't be the whole story, right? Because two isogeny classes with the same data had different angle rank. And so by just like looking at a bunch of data and like playing with it, um, Dupuy, Kid Lyons, Eric Brown came up with this like wonderful tool to study um, the angle rank. And, and I think like captures beautifully the relationship between Newton polygon, Gallo group and angle rank. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about um, for the rest of our time together. Honestly, I can't even see what time it is. Oh, we're doing great. Okay. I do want to pause and give a shout out to Chi, who in 92 showed results very similar um, or like had a very similar idea to the idea I'm about to present that's in uh, DKZB. But it's, it's very complicated. And one thing that I really appreciate about the tool um, in this paper is how simple and easy to understand it is. And so I really think that even if you wanted to say that like this was somehow known, the exposition in this paper is really good and like really clarified things. I think compared, I mean, and I that's no diss on, on this paper by Chi. It's an amazing paper that explains a lot of things really well, explains the connection between abelian variety, you know, the um, the take conjecture like over um, number fields and finite fields. And it, it's, it's a really great paper, but the ideas that DKZB revisit are, are a lot clearer, I think, in their article. And it's not just because I'm married to one of the authors. I think it's objectively true. Okay. So I said that they were related to the Galois group and the Newton polygon, and then I told you that I would tell you what this was, and so now I'm making good on my promise. So you Maybe you remember, maybe you don't, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna tell you again. If the isogeny class is simple, which like we're working with absolutely simple, geometrically simple. So it's like even more than that, the Vey polynomial is an irreducible polynomial to some power. And then the Galois group of the isogeny class, right? It's just the Galois group of this irreducible polynomial. Another way to think about it, right? Is like if the alpha i's are the roots of P, therefore they're also the roots of H, right? You would join them all to Q because if it is irreducible, um, that's a full set of Galois conjugates. And so uh, this extension is Galois and you take the Galois group, okay? So um, there's a Galois group. It acts on the roots, right? So if we're talking about like algebraic relations between the roots, then maybe we think that something acting on the roots um, will have to do with it, and, and that would be correct. And now the Newton polygon, okay? So um, I'm going to fix a place V above P in my Galois closure. Okay, so I, I'm gonna call this one Galois closure pretty much, right? It, it's the field that contain, oh, the splitting field of the Vey polynomial. That might, that, that's better than Galois closure, okay? So you take a place above P, remember P is a characteristic of the field, um, in the splitting field of the Vey polynomial and you normalize it so Q has size one. And then the Newton polygon, right? is a piecewise linear function. So it's a bunch of line segments, continuous. So the line segments like touch, right? Non-decreasing derivatives. So you have line segments and the slopes are only going up or staying the same. And so all of that remains to tell you is what are the slopes, right? The slopes are the valuation of the roots of the Vey polynomial. So here are examples, right? So um, up here, we have a uh, Newton polygon with slopes 0, 0, 1 half, 1 half, 1, 1, okay? So this is, we, we took this Vey polynomial, we took the roots, we took a place above P, we computed the valuation and we got 0, 0, 1 half, 1 half, 1, 1. Okay, that's something that can happen. And so then we make a line segment of length one and slope zero, another one, and then, a, length, a line seg segment of length one. I guess the projection has length one, okay? Not like the actual line segment because like, I know that because it's diagonal is longer than one. My apologies. Uh, so another segment of length one, slope one half, slope one half, and then slope one, and then slope one, right? So this is dimension three because there are six roots and the polynomial is always of, um, the Vey polynomial is always degree two G for an isogeny class of dimension G. Sometimes, all of the roots um, have the same absolute, have the same valuation, okay? Um, valuation one half, and then you just like make like a big one half line like that. That's the super singular case. 
The ordinary case, which I um, talked about, like I said, I would tell you, is when the slopes are zero, 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 and then one, one, one. So, um, and, and let me do zero, zero, one, one, one here, right? Zero, 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 one, one, one. It's actually a fun fact that has nothing to do with this talk, but I feel like I have to tell you that every Newton polygon is between those two. The one that has like the just like one line with slope one half and the one that's like zero for half the time and then one for half the time. And then every other Newton polygon is like somehow between. So starts, you know, with maybe some zeros and then, you know, like goes up and then goes up more. Um, but that's fun. And that gives you a partial ordering on, of Newton polygons, like as they kind of go up to reach the super singular case. But anyway, that's a Newton polygon. OK, so put yourself back in that state of mind where um, we care about the angle rank, but kind of in the back of our mind, the good situation is getting that the angle rank is large because that would imply the take conjecture, right? We, we would like maximal angle rank as much as possible because that's the easy way to prove the take conjecture. So the kind of dual of um, the rank, right, of these angles is a relationship between the angles, right? Um, I, I think of it as kind of like like the rank that you get is like the a row a kind of row space right and a relationship between the angles you know would be like kind of in a null space right and so so they go together every time you have a relation the angle ring goes down by one and if you have a relation among the angles it, it actually comes from a multiplicative relation among the roots right because when you when you raise um to some power e that's like multiplying the angle by e so if you have a vector space and you're taking some angle and you're multiplying by two it's like squaring the root um you know whose angle that was and so um we could have defined the angle rank as being um the rank of multiplicative relations between the roots, and it would have been the same thing. You, you, you have to still subtract one, okay? But um, all of these alphas are roots of an irreducible polynomial, so Galois acts on it, right? This Galois group of the splitting field, it'll permute these alphas on the left, but it'll fix the Q on the right. So it means that whenever you have a relation with some like EIs, you, you get some relations by the Galois action where you're permuting the EIs according to the Galois relation, right? So the Galois group acts on the relations. So that's um, going to be part of it. So G is still the Galois group of the splitting field. Okay, just bring back the notation every once in a while. And so the idea, right, is that this angle ring space whose dimension we were trying to, to find is, is kind of complicated. It's hard to get our hands on. Like the roots are, you know, like, I mean, if we knew everything about the roots of a polynomials, we would know so much more about abelian varieties, right? And so it's a complicated, it's a complicated Q vector space that carries an action of the Galois group. Right. And so, um, you know, that's that's just a fancy way to say that is a Q vector space with an action of G is a QG module. So this is a complicated QG module. And what um, Dupuis, Kedlaya, Kedlaya and Zurich Brown find is a simpler QG module that carries the same information and therefore about which they can prove theorems about angle ring, but while working with something simpler than like the whole thing with the roots. Okay, so just to say, right, um, so I started by defining the angle rank, it was like the dimension of some big span minus one, right, so I could have instead of giving you the span of the angles, I could have given you like the multiplicative group generated by the angles and, and taking the rank of that. Um, so that's some abelian group, so it has a rank minus one. So those are um, equivalent formulations of the problems but I, I did with angle because like otherwise why are we calling it angle rank right so it's literally the rank of um of a vector space generated by angles 
Okay. So what's that space? They call it the Newton hyperplane representation. And I'm gonna describe it to you because like I said, it's simple and beautiful. So for each J first, um, I'm gonna define BJ to be alpha J over alpha bar, uh, alpha J bar. And I mean, I guess maybe I should have said this here, just assume that we fixed forever an ordering of the roots of the Weil polynomial, alpha one through alpha G, and then the complex conjugates like alpha one bar, alpha two bar through alpha G bar. Okay, so there, there's there's no confusion like which one's the alpha, which one's the alpha bar. So beta is well defined, like you just fix that. It's like fixing a basis in your vector space. Okay, then the, the Newton hyperplane representation, right? The QG module that we're gonna study is spanned by these vectors of length g that are just taking every valuation above p and taking the valuation of each beta, right? So, okay, so you have your prime p, that's the characteristic, right? In the splitting field, there's a bunch of primes above it. So you take a prime above p, you compute the valuation of each beta that gives you a vector you put it in your space. You take another prime above P, you compute the valuation of each beta that goes in your space, another valuation, another vector, right? And you, you want to see what, how, how big is this space? Now, why is it simpler? It's, it's simpler than working directly with the alphas or with the angles because we're working with valuation and it'll turn out, I mean, this, this is how we can connect to the Newton polygon. Um, directly. So the first result is that this space, right, that that contains only the valuation information of these betas, right? Like we've we've thrown out like all kinds of stuff, right? We were talking about the angles of the alphas, like we forget all about that. We just take the valuations of the betas at primes above p. This space has the same dimension as the angle rank. So it's a good um it's good news, like if we can study this space and we can get its dimension, then we'll get the angle rank. And the proof of it is really simple. So if I have a, multi a multiplicative relation among the alpha i's, I get a multiplicative relation between the beta i's because the beta is just like alpha divided um, by alpha bar. And um, if you have like some alpha bar in the relation, you can just like divide through by that and put it with the betas and get a relationship like this. Not necessarily um, is equal to one, right? So all, each of these um, betas has absolute value one because the alphas all have the same absolute value. Um, so they're not going to multiply to some power of Q, they're going to multiply to some root of unity. Okay. And then um, to show that the dimension of V is the same as the dimension of the angle rank, you, the authors show that um, an equation like this holds if and only if the kind of like analogous linear combination is zero for the valuations above P. So let me walk you through the proof. So First, for every non-Archimedean valuation in the splitting field that is not above P, these betas have um, absolute values, have valuation zero. So for every non-Archimedean prime that doesn't divide P, this is zero, this is zero, this is zero. So this equation is satisfied no matter what Fs, but in particular with these Fs. Now, um, if I look at the Archimedean absolute values, because the absolute values of the betas are all one, then those valuations are also all zeros, right? So the point is that if this equation holds for all valuations above P, it actually holds for all valuations of the splitting field, period. Because it's, it's vacuously true for the other valuations that are, that are not above P. So once we have this, then we see that this B1, oops, beta one to the F1, beta two to the F2, beta G to the FG, right? When you multiply that, the number that you get has valuation zero for every single valuation in the splitting field. And by Kronecker's theorem, that has to be a root of unity. And so we get that not only does the you know, multiplicative relation like this give us 
um, a, a linear combination that's zero, but a linear combination that's zero, even if that's very little information, is enough to guarantee a multiplicative relation among the betas. And so that's, that's the whole point is that it, it feels when you take valuations, like you've thrown out so much information that maybe it's hopeless, but actually the kind of relationships we're looking for are, can, can be completely read off from this space V that only contains information about the valuations of the BIs. All right. So V is a vector space. Remember the vectors in it are like you pick a valuation above P and you take the valuation of the, you know, each of the betas. Now, how can I act um, by Galois on it? So an easy way to see it, or, or I mean, okay. So you could just like act directly, right? Um, the betas are in the splitting fields. So you can act by Galois and like keep track of it, but it's actually really neat um, to think about it this way. So fix the labeling of the roots and, and, actually, and it comes in the proofs later. So um, fix the labeling of the roots of the vape polynomial, right? Like I said, like first G roots and then their complex conjugates, right? So you fix like which one is alpha, you know, and which one is alpha bar for one through G. And then to describe an element of the Galois group, right? To describe how um, uh, sigma is, is permuting these, I can keep track of two pieces of information. So first, if sigma of alpha J is alpha K, then sigma of alpha J bar is alpha K bar. That's because complex conjugation commutes with everything in G. If sigma of alpha J is alpha K bar, then sigma of alpha J bar is alpha K. And so you can just keep track of kind of which J goes to which K. That's like one piece of information. And then within that, right, you wanna keep track well, okay, I know that, you know, the J's went to the K's, but you'll keep track of plus one if alpha J went to alpha K or minus one if alpha J went to alpha K bar. Okay, so you can keep, you so an element of G can be given by a permutation on G elements, not two G elements, right? Just saying like which J went to which K and then a sign telling you if the alpha and the alpha bar were swapped or not. So this is just the same facts again, but like um, scrunched up a little, okay? But this tells you that a sigma in G can be represented by a signed G by G permutation matrix, right? So you take the permutation matrix that describes the top bullet point, right? So that's a matrix that has like mostly zero entries and just a one in entry IK if, or JK if alpha J goes to alpha K. And then a signed matrix is that, well, actually you don't put ones, right? You put a one or a minus one, depending on if the alphas um, get switched or not. And that gives you a G by G matrix, which you can use to um, multiply this vector. So there's a really like concrete action of the group action on here. And it, and it um, agrees with the Galois action on the betas, right? Because, um, you know, if beta one goes to beta two, it's because, um, alpha one bar divided by uh, alpha one divided by alpha one bar goes to alpha two divided by alpha two bar, right? So like this, the the permutation like of the i go the one going to two like does keep track of what's happening to the alphas, right? And then if alpha and alpha bar are switched, then I'm kind I'm sending you know my beta j to beta k inverse, which exactly picks up a negative sign on the valuation. So th this is like the legit Galois action. It's not just like a made up action, but it's a particularly nice way to think about it. And and this is a not not just like it's nice, like good for you, right? But it's part of the proofs to think of the action of the Galois group on these this way, or the proofs um, that I will present. Okay. Another thing that this gives us that we'll need is that this gives us um, a description of G as an extension of some subgroup of SG um, by, you know, all these like sign flipping, right? So there's, there's, you know, the Galois action on the roots can be kept track of 
you know, as like permuting G elements, which alpha I's or alpha J's goes to which, you know, alpha K's and like the sign, like does the alpha go to alpha bar or not? So these, these um, subgroups will, will come back. Okay, so that's it. That's the space. It's wonderful. And I'm going to quickly in my last five minutes, go through four results um, that they obtain with this to show you the, the power of, of the, um, that space, right? Like just this vector space evaluations of betas with the G action on it is enough to prove. Um, so first, reprove a result of Leinster's RN that was obtained in 93, which is that um, if the Newton slopes, right? So if the Newton polygon has um, slope one half with multiplicity two, and every other slope has odd denominator, so we saw one that was like zero, 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 one half, one half, one, 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 right? Like that. So two one halves and then stuff with odd denominator. Um, then in even dimension, the isogeny class has maximal angle rank. And in odd dimension, then the isogeny class has angle rank, either G minus one or G. So right away, um, this proves to take conjecture in even dimension whenever the Newton polygon is of a certain kind. And I mean, this is a result that was already known, like I said, but the Leinster's RN paper is 16 pages and um, the DKZB proof is like one paragraph once the technology is set up. So it really gives you insight, I think, in the problem that wasn't explicit before. I mean, I'm not going to say that I know what Leinster or Zarin was thinking. Maybe they had this insight. Um, now, um, Tankeev in 84 showed that um, if G is prime, then the isogeny class, um, if it's absolutely simple, right, has to have angle rank either one, G minus one, or G. So DKZB are able to generalize this with, with their technique. So um, there's a certain, the action of just the subgroup C on, on these beta I's gives rise to a decomposition um, into a direct sum of spaces it's M spaces. And so if the dimension divided by M is prime, then you can show that the isogeny class has rank M, G minus M or G. So um, this is a big generalization of the, the theorem here to um, allow this. They also have a third result, um, like completely new. So remember that the G, right, you can, kind of split up into two parts. So if G acts primitively on one through G and C is non-trivial, so C always contains the vector with all ones because that's complex conjugation. But if it contains anything else than that, um, then the isogeny class has maximal angle rank. So that's um, like a whole new class of abelian varieties for which the T conjecture is proved. And then um, the last result is an effective bound on the weight of the exponents that can give, uh, that, that generate all the relations, right? So Zarin had a theorem showing that if you have a vector that gives you a relation, right, the kind of multiplicative relation we're looking for, then all of these vectors are generated in weight less than or equal to some constant. But he didn't say the constant. And so um, in their work, DKZB are able to give a constant. Um, so this is the size of the Galois group. Delta is um, the angle rank, right? And G is the dimension as before. So they're able to use their really like simple space, explicit description of the action to get an explicit bound on um, the weights that generate the relations. All right, so that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Christelle. That was wonderful. Well, let's Thank see. You. Are there any questions for the talk? Oh, okay, okay, okay. I just found the chat, y'all. It was <laughs> open under <laughs> my presentation thing. Nice. Uh, could you say a little bit more about why having these odd denominators turned out to be important in that result? 
Yeah. Um, so it's this one. And so um, what happens is that basically the C part of the Gawa group, um, acts on essentially these valuations mod two, like kind of forgets the sign. Okay, so now I'm I'm uh, taking an isomorphism of the group of plus or minus one to C2, and I'm going to be talking about one and zero. So one is like non-trivial and zero is trivial, right? And so um, this, this, this keep, keeps track of the parity. And so by ensuring that the slopes are like this, in your space V, you have a vector um, that has all ones and one zero. And then by acting on Galois, you just get like a whole bunch mm. you, you, of of rank <laughs> a whole bunch of stuff yeah so that that's the significance you need the slopes to kind of give you like the other ones be all one so they can't have um even denominator oh cool yeah and it's like super explicit in their paper it's really nice like i didn't have to work to understand that like the the technology anyway i mean obviously i think it's really neat because i just spent an hour telling you about it so mm -hmm. Um, hey, Christelle. Thanks a lot for the talk. It's You're Jeff. welcome. Yeah. Hi, um, Jeff. I don't know if you know this or if anybody else on the call knows it, but is there, like, so of all the um, abelian varieties that you've been churning through, what proportion of them do you think we know the Tate conjecture for as a species? Like, if we sort of use all the different tricks that we have for saying, oh, the Tate conjecture holds for this one or that one, um, has anybody tried to? like apply all of them at once and go through the database and see what's left over? I think that um, some something like having ankle rank G is like open or whatever you say yep. to say like that this is what happens. Um, I mean, probably like, so I, so now I know Kieran and David and Taylor are on the call. Um, so, so maybe they can say like a little bit more about like experimentally what, um, you know, what we've seen, but it's like the very vast majority of a billion sure. isogeny classes has maximal angle rank. Like that's what happens. So quick question related to that. I mean, do we know the take conjecture for non-maximal angle rank ever? Like we've seen various places where you're able to prove that the angle rank is maximal, but like what other tools do we have for actually proving the take conjecture? Well, like um, Milne has a result where he says if, um, if such and such happens with the left chest group, then even though they're exotic classes, I'm not scared. And I can still prove the take conjecture for this class of abelian varieties. And Christelle, yeah. I'm really sorry about the slight thread drift on this question. I, uh, I'm just excited about these ideas. No, I'm, you know, I was terrified no one would ask anything. So please. <laughs> um, so, so, so David, that was an example of like a, a different kind of trick where you know that the, as my understanding from what, Priscilla just taught me is that when um, when you have maximal angle rank, then um, all classes come from divisors, and then we're good. And so, the, I guess the question I'm asking about is stuff kind of thinner down, or, yeah. or you know, is sparse. And like and so as Christelle that, said, it's a higher co-dimension where these things live. So there's that Milne result, and then Tankeev in his. So I mentioned his result um, here, right, that the angle rank had to be like one G minus one and G, but actually, um, even in the case where the angle rank is G minus one, he proves that um, the they satisfy the Tate conjecture. So there's definitely some way, you know, to leverage like even angle rank G minus one in that case um, to prove the Tate conjecture. So, so, okay, so here, when, when G is prime, and the endomorphism ring is abelian, uh, is commutative, then the angle rings can only be G minus one or G. And he uses that directly to prove um, the Tate conjecture. And then when the endomorphism ring is not uh, commutative, then I think he does something different. So um, the, the case of one happens when the um, endomorphism ring is not commutative and then he does something different. So there's definitely like a few other techniques here and there. But like nothing that like the kind of like unified push to prove that angle ranks are maximal. 
So just as a statistic, 93% of a billion varieties in the database have maximal angle rank. Okay. David, is that simple or, or all of That's them? all. I can check for simple as well. Yeah, because a lot of the, the stuff that we've been talking about was specifically for simple ones. Yeah, give me a sec. I mean, sorry, can I, can I keep pushing on this for a minute or am, or am I just really being annoying? Yeah. Maybe, no, maybe I can wait to see if there are other kind of angle rank questions and then I'll hold, hold forth about this in a bit. I'm sorry, Christelle. All right, Everyone here's why it would be, <laughs> sorry. 98.2 for simple. So one reason it would be kind of like, I can imagine, I mean, so I take an article, I, I believe in the take conjecture, so I don't expect to find anything like really new by looking at the ones that you can't easily prove the take conjecture for. But like you all like are really well positioned to, like you, you know so much about what kinds of things are happening over these finite fields in, in small dimension that you, it seems plausible to me that one could pick out one where you don't, you can't appeal to angle rank or something like that, and then start comparing the Gala representation that you get to like, you know, now I have this exotic take class and I have to explain it geometrically, but like you guys have a whole bunch of geometry lying around. And so it might be first just kind of fun to go prove the take conjecture for everything in the database, but you also might learn new, um, you know, source, there, there might be some regularities that emerge where you could use your expertise for the database and this extra geometry that you found to then start finding other circumstances in which we can prove the take conjecture. And it's unlikely to get everywhere, but it might get somewhere a little further than we got. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or not. Yeah. Right, that's the point, Taylor, is that nobody knows where they come from. You can sort of see that the you can kind of construct them linear algebraically, but um, because in this case you can actually, you know, I need a, I really need something with a Galva representation that does this. You're uniquely well positioned to go find one, and then you can start trying to find a correspondence which explains it. Sorry, I'm just catching up with the chat. I just like I found it again. <laughs> I, I was just gonna say, like, it's it's weird that they're in isogeny. The exotic classes are in isogeny classes too, because like I, isogeny classes aren't varieties or anything, right? So it's not like you can have some family of algebraic cycles or or like a, I don't know, like yeah, I, I don't even know what to ha, how to how to construct the weird exotic cycle oh, but geometrically, like, but. You know, the, the take classes are kind of isogeny, you know, they kind of want to only be defined up to isogeny anyway, somehow. And so yeah. if my right is isogenous, so um, so the same kind of correspondence we could probably push around with isogenies also. Okay, yeah. yeah, I mean, if you actually write down a cycle, oh, okay, 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 okay. then you can move, apply an isogeny. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, yeah, 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 yeah. All right, well, let's thank Christelle again. Thank you for having me.